Hey everyone, well thanks for tuning in to AFTM Online and AFTM, as I hope you know, stands for the Austin Friends of Traditional Music and we're an organization here in Austin, Texas, which has been around since 1974 and that means this is our 50th anniversary. We're pretty excited about that and having some events to celebrate that throughout the year here in Austin. We're an organization that's dedicated to promoting all kinds of traditional music. And our big event every year takes place in October. And that is the Austin String Band Festival. And I'm pleased to be the director of that event for again this year. Now, you've already got it penciled into your calendars, I'm sure, for the 18th and 19th of October out at Camp Ben McCullough in Driftwood, Texas. But after you listen to today's guest, I think penciling in will not be sufficient. You'll want to have some kind of indelible marker to put that in your calendar because you will not want to miss it. It's a great event. Look forward to it every year. And as I say, it's the highlight of our year at the Austin Friends of Traditional Music. One quick plug for our newsletter. It's called Real Times, and it's available at our website at aftm.us. The new edition will be available on July 1, 2024. It'll have information about all the performers who will be uh, performing at our festival this year, including the gentleman I have the pleasure of speaking with right now, and that's Mr. Jerron Paxton. Jerron, how are you doing today? I'm doing very good, Gary. How are you? Well, I'm doing good. I've had some uh, had some time to practice some music already today, and I did the dishes, and I think I'm all ready to uh, have a little conversation with, with you. Um, you is it correct that you are in New York? Yes, I've been living in New York since 2010. Uh huh. But your earliest days were not spent on the East Coast. At, well, I believe you're a you're a West Coast person. Is that right? Yes, I came to the West uh, from the West Coast uh, in 2010. I was born in a little place called South Central Los Angeles, where uh, everybody tends to be. Uh, from either the uh, deep south or the extreme south with places like Mexico and Guatemala and places like that. Uh-huh. And your uh, your family is from what part of the country originally? Uh, my family's from Louisiana. Uh-huh. And growing up in South Central, I'm sure there was all kinds of popular music going around then, but did, you were exposed to traditional music pretty early. Is that true to say? Well, I guess the music that was popular for the generation that raised me was uh, still popular when I was coming along. So it's just all pop music, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And was, was there any uh, music in your household as you were growing up? Plenty. Ah, right. Yeah. And can you tell me more about that, which many generations involved with that? Uh, well, you know, everybody listens to music. I don't know uh, a person or people that don't listen to music. Uh, if they do, they're a little off. Uh, <laughs> That's for sure. I'm a, little, I'm a little off, but hopefully in a good way. Uh, uh, but I ain't so far off as I don't appreciate art. Um, and every gener, you know, well, uh, I'm afraid if I uh, explaining this to you, it'd just be like reiterating American history. You know, uh, uh, black folks in America and cre uh, created a new genre of music almost every decade for the past 130, uh, ooh, at this point, 160 years. Um, so you know, anybody who was alive through that period shared their music in the house you know my mother my grandmother my great-grandmother you know all those folks had music uh my father had his music uh, you know different uncles like different type of music and the kids like different type of music you know so everybody's got their taste i i just had taste that more suited uh, uh the older folks that raised me uh-huh and at what point in your life would you say that you started thinking about making music be your career? Was that, did that come on along pretty early? Oh, I never tried to really make music my career. You know, it was always a, a plan B. You know, I was going to uh, 
uh, yeah, I would go to work for the railroad or something like that. That was my real passion. I thought that would be the way I'd see the world was through, you know, trains. I love driving trains and well, I love working on them and things like that. But, uh, 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 that ended up not being too good. I don't. I have a bit of trouble with my vision, so uh, people don't like uh, folks that don't have peripheral vision driving their locomotives. Uh, I, I partially under. I partially understand that, uh-huh. but you know, if somebody is willing to get on the railroad track when they see a train coming, you know, uh, you got to let nature take its course. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peripheral vision won't really help in that situation. I guess. Yeah, I'm on the tracks anyway. Leave me alone. You know? uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember it was when you first made a performance uh, in public? I think I was about 12 years old, and uh-huh. um, um, it was for a little uh, concert uh, at my little local Catholic school, St. Eugene, and... I had to go up there and play two pieces, Uh, you know, uh, schools like classical music. So I had to play my little Bach musette for the people uh, and they got their little applause. And then I cut loose with something hot on the fiddle. I think it must have been, what is that song, Uh, Old Joe Clark or something like that. Uh, And that like to blew the roof off the little church, you know, (laughs) because Especially back in them times. If you was, you know, a lot of folks in there was in their 80s, late 80s, some of them, you know, so they was born back in the days when that music was still popular. You know, that was some of the last generations to see uh, black fiddle players and banjo players be popular and be around and be a thing, you know. Over the course of the next couple of decades, yeah, uh, uh, people stopped associating black folks with banjos and fiddles. Well, I wish I could have seen that show. You started out at the keyboard with the Bach piece, is that right? No, they were both on violin. Ah, so um, did you grow up taking violin lessons then? Well, that was my first year of violin lessons at Ah. age 12, yeah. Uh Yeah, and I know at this point you play a whole lot of different instruments. Um, You're an incredible banjo player. Do you play the keyboard also, piano? Yes, uh, that's uh, piano was one of the reasons I moved to New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, New York City was a place I found you could hear 1920s style jazz seven days a week, you know, good Harlem stride piano, and that's what I want to learn. Uh, and I came out here to try to learn that style and get good at it. Uh, mm-hmm. For a couple years, I was uh, that was my main source of income, playing uh, uh, old hot jazz piano, 20 style piano and six string banjo. Uh, and, you know, now that's a little bit harder. I love playing jazz music and playing jazz gigs with, you know, uh, some of the jazz festivals are uh, run by uh, folks who are a little bit more uptight than, <laughs> than the average person who comes to enjoy music, you know. Uh, I was saying I, you know, I really enjoy playing string band and country festivals and blues festivals and all that because they're real people there really care about the music uh, in a different way. And, you know, jazz festivals tended to be, in my experience as a professional, more about the fashion of the thing. So it's uh, uh, I'm more into the music, I should say. I understand. Well, one performer that'll be at our festival as well is a band called the Joymakers. And I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're led by an, a gentleman from Austin, uh, Colin Hancock, who is a fantastic musician and a real student of 1920s jazz, especially from Texas. So I think you're going to get to hear some of that traditional uh, jazz music uh, while you're out here as well, as well as a bunch of other kinds of music. But getting back wait, to your music. Wait, hold on. Colin was yeah. my... Uh... Colin was my neighbor. Colin lived about a, oh, about a good 20-minute walk from me here in Brooklyn. I'm in Queens, but, you know, the, the border's only a- Whoops. Darn it. 
I don't know if you can hear me, Jerron, but I lost you completely there, and I'm looking at my own face again. Well, oh, how, um, Jerron, I, I, can you hear me again? Yes. Ooh, what happened there? I had no idea, but I couldn't hear you anymore. Now all, all I could see on the screen was my own face, so it was a little discouraging. Yeah. <laughs> it was discouraging for me too. I thought you left. <laughs> <laughs> but so I didn't realize that you and Colin were acquaintances. But you say you were neighbors in New York City. Oh yeah, Colin had a nice little acoustic recording studio down here in Brooklyn. So I'd walk over there every chance I get to do it. Because in addition to jazz, he's also interested in the uh late 19th century recordings and uh uh that just happened to coincide with my love of the late 19th century banjo music uh so i had got a good time uh uh recording some of those vess osmond and fred van epp solos uh in collins basement we had a good time terry waldo on the piano and all sorts of folks over oh man that sounds wonderful. Well, then you, I don't have to tell you about Colin, but he is a real treasure of the Austin musical scene, and his band, the Joymakers, will be performing at the festival as well. Um, uh, yeah, I hope I hope you all appreciate him before I, we steal him back from you. <laughs> I sure do. I uh, got to talk to him a little bit after his performance last year, and he's a great guy and truly a wonderful musician. So uh, he is he is a treasure of the Austin scene. Well, how many instruments would you say you play at this point on a regular basis? Are there quite a few? Well, I usually travel with four instruments. Uh, oh, no. Well, I travel with a fiddle, a guitar, and two banjos, and a thing full of harmonicas and some bones. So that's six. But, you know, sometimes counting the little ones don't uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't really do the trust, you know. But uh, So it's about between five or six, depending on how you count them. Mm hmm. And uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, you played up in Fort Worth at the Fort Worth African American uh, Roots Music Festival, and I saw a gig coming up for you out in Georgia at the Blind Willie McTell Festival. Uh, that sounds like a fun event. Have you played that event before? Yes, I can't remember the last time. Oh, it's, it was sometime before the pandemic, but yeah, that's a good festival. Uh huh. As I mentioned to you earlier, Willie McTell is a big, uh, a big favorite of mine, and I think when I got interested in him, it wasn't even known how long he had lived. But now his, I think his grave is marked, and it's right there in the Thompson, Georgia area. So uh, that's a very historic place, and it sounds like a fun festival. Well, that's uh, this summer, and of course our festival comes up in autumn, and. It's beautiful weather during that festival, Jerron. The high average is about 80. The low average is about 60. Unlike the current weather, which is pretty brutal. It's a little too hot to have <laughs> an outdoor festival here. But we are so anxious to see you uh, when you finally do get here in October. And your recordings are available on the Smithsonian Folkways label. Is that correct? Well, they're getting to be uh, available. I got a record that's going to come out pretty soon with Folkways, a nice little uh, record. It's mostly blues for my blues-loving folks. Um, and, yeah, that's going to come out pretty soon. And I've got uh, some other ones out with a little duo project with my buddy Dennis Lickman, who plays about uh, four or five instruments, and I play four or five instruments, and together we sound like eight people. Uh, so yeah, I, that's a lovely project to be a part of. Also, well, excellent. Perhaps uh, will you have some recordings available uh, with you? Do you expect when you come out here in October? Oh, of course. All right, all right. Because I, I'm personally connected with the merchandise manager, and she'll be very happy to uh, help uh, merchandise your work there and get them into the hands of our local festival goers. And again, our festival takes place at. Uh, Camp Ben McCullough, which is just outside Austin, Texas, and it's on October 18 and 19 this year. And what kind of workshop do you expect you might give us uh, on the afternoon there, probably on Saturday the 19th? Uh, well, usually when it comes to workshops, I've been, like I said, I've been more interested in playing the banjo lately, and especially at string band festivals. 
it affords me an opportunity to teach a little banjo music. So um, I really uh, spent, oh, about the past five or six years, especially, like I said, during the pandemic time, where I could uh, learn some music that I would never be paid for because <laughs> very few people care about it. But uh, I spent that time uh, learning to play a bunch of good ragtime on the five-string banjo, you know, uh, five-string banjo is an instrument for ragtime. Uh, Scott Joplin played the five-string banjo. People talk about his mother playing it, but he played it and likely composed a maple leaf rag on it or for it. Uh, and I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's Joe, Joe Jordan's uh, responsibility that it moved from banjo to piano. And since it did that, it's been a hit every year since 1899. Uh, and if it had a stayed on banjo, it uh, probably would have died in 1917 with all the other uh, uh, 19th century styles of playing the banjo. Uh, well, I but yeah, I, go ahead. I was just going to say that I had no idea that Joplin played banjo. I've always thought of his compositions as piano originally, but uh, it, it likely that the five-string banjo was involved in the birth of that song then. Well, his his compositions are piano compositions, but his influences are varied. And uh, before he was known as the king of uh, ragtime composers, not performers, but composers, uh, he was making a much better living uh, singing with a quartet and teaching banjo lessons. Uh, much more so than playing piano, so far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I've really enjoyed learning that uh, that traditional style of playing uh, the five-string banjo, which tends to get overlooked by more rural styles. But this, in fact, is a style that went everywhere in America. It's not reduced to a regionalism. It's what we played everywhere, what we shipped overseas and around the world. And uh, now it's, for some reason, it's rare in the rural styles, uh, which should be rare uh, everywhere, you know. <laughs> you, you, you can sit here in, North, in uh, New York City and, you know, it sounds like you're in a very specific part of North Carolina, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would be looking forward to that as a great fan of ragtime music. And, and I'm pretty ignorant of the classical banjo of the 19th century. I know about it, but I really have not heard much. So I'll be looking forward to that workshop and look forward to meeting you in person. And uh, I really do appreciate you finding time today uh, to to uh, talk with us. Uh, do you get to perform much in your New York City area during the year, Duran? Ah, uh, occasionally, and usually those gigs are for fun. Those gigs are to uh, enjoy the community. Like I said, the jazz community is very thick out here, and. You know, there gets to be a certain group of folks that you can play with at the uh, one of the good jams at Mona's here on Avenue B between 13th and 14th. Every Tuesday, there's one of the best hot jazz jams in New York City. Uh, it's been going for 15 years. And, you know, that's one of my favorite places to get reconnoited with what's going on. And depending who's in the band, you can play some real deep cuts, you know. Yeah, you know, you're not just playing the top 20 uh, uh, hot jazz tunes, you know, you could play King Oliver tunes and Jelly Roll Morton tunes and, you know, all the sort of stuff. Colin was in there and he was a part of that scene, too. And it's it's just lovely, man. Uh, that's that's my usual place. But so far as professional musicians go, if you play your hometown, eventually you'll get reduced to playing bars and restaurants. And there's no two ways about it. You know, you can't play the big places not even once a month, you know, even in a town as big as in New York City. So it's best for us, uh, it's best for us uh, professional musicians to stay traveling and to stay touring uh, because it's the only way to get the. Uh, uh, to get a price that makes it a that you can make a living do it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, until it gets back to the days where there were twenty thousand card carrying musicians yeah. in New York City, and you could spend as much money on a banjo as you could an automobile, and know that that banjo was going to feed your family for you. Uh, until those days come back again, we're going to have to 
keep traveling as a musician. So it's going to be able to travel down to Texas and see y'all. Well, we are looking forward to it. And then it just so happens, I think I'm going to be in New York City on the first Tuesday of August this year. So maybe I can talk my wife into making a trip over to that fine establishment. What was the name of that uh, venue that you mentioned? It's Mona's, M-O-N-A apostrophe S. Every uh -huh. Tuesday from 9 to midnight, there's a uh, sort of open jam with a house band uh, and a real uh, steadfast jam from midnight till, oh, let's say about 4 o'clock in the morning uh, with a uh, piano player that is extremely confident. Usually it's our buddy John Weber who knows more about music <laughs> than most libraries uh, and uh, it is a hot time Man. well that sounds great and it has been a great pleasure talking to you Jerron as I say we're looking forward to seeing you in October and that's about it I think for our little conversation here I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in and checking this out and you'll be surely anxious to hear Jerron performing in uh person this October 18 and 19, the Austin String Band Festival. For more information at our website, aftm.us. So thanks for tuning in, and thanks, Jerron, for spending time with us. Cheers, buddy. Take care. Okay. Well, we did it. We made history. That was that was pretty easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, I. but you've been interviewed by some really good people and some wonderful video quality on these and, you know, very professional production values. And, of course, my production values are minimal, shall we say. But, uh, <laughs> but cheers, my man. Well, it's fun to do. You made it painless. Oh, well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you. And uh, maybe I will get to see you in August. That would be fun. Uh you know, I'm, I'm on the senior citizen Midwest time schedule, which in, me usually means an early bedtime. But maybe I can crank myself up with some coffee during the day and make it to Mona's on Tuesday night. Uh, crank yourself up with some coffee at night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Stop. it's... That's that's what keeps me on the late schedule out here. Everything closes at 4 o'clock in the morning, so it's... Uh, it's hard to get to bed. And I like getting to bed early, you know. I like having a day, but boy, is it hard sometimes to, uh, to do that when you, you go to bed at 6 in the morning. And <laughs> oh, you need yeah. eight hours of sleep. And where is Mona's? Is it in Queens? or? It's it's on the Lower East Side. Ah, okay. Well, that's not so far from us. We're staying on Manhattan around, I don't know. 21st and Broadway or something like that. I, something like that. Okay, yeah, this is on 14th uh, between Avenue A and B. Uh-huh. Well, thanks again for your time, Jerron. We'll be in touch with you between now and then, I'm sure, but I'm looking forward to meeting you in a couple months. All right, my friend. We'll till then. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care. See you.